Let me now introduce you to the 2005 Gordon Lecturer. She is Dr. Catherine Mann. Dr. Mann is a senior fellow at the Institute for International Economics in Washington, DC. She is one of the world's foremost authorities on the subjects of globalization and technological change. She's authored numerous books and peer-reviewed articles on these topics and on issues such as electronic commerce, taxation, intellectual property, trade negotiations, the balance of trade, and the value of the US dollar. Her forthcoming book is entitled High Tech and Globalization in America. When the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times wants an expert, frequently she is the one on whom they call. Catherine Mann earned her undergraduate education at Harvard, I should say earned her degree at Harvard University, and her PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Prior to joining the Institute for International Economics, she served as the Assistant Director of the International Finance Division of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. As a senior international economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and as an advisor to the Chief Economist at the World Bank. She will address us today on the economic gains and policy challenges of global sourcing and technological change. It is a great honor for us to bring her to the Oakland University campus. Ladies and gentlemen, please give, join with me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Catherine Mann from the Institute of International Economics. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. I'm very impressed with the background of Alice Connor Gordon. And so I very much want to carry on the legacy of her uh, time here in assisting in the uh, understanding of the US in the global economy. Uh, now, that introduction uh, uh, of my uh, background was really um, kind of over the top, and uh, especially in the part where, where um, your uh, department head said, uh, you know, she's the global expert on, on outsourcing. Um, you know, I think that's not quite right. I mean, I think most of you either are or will become soon, as you go out into the labor market, you will become the experts on global sourcing because you're going to be in the middle of it. If you not, if you aren't already, and so uh, understanding uh, what we think about the U.S. and the global economy and the implications of greater integration of the U.S. and the global economy is what I want to talk about today. We know a lot, we have a lot more to learn, uh, and putting that together with uh, the policy environment is what I want to talk about today. I'm going to start by asking you to give me a little, uh, we're going to do a little poll here. Um, I'm going to talk about change. And I want to know how you feel about change. I've given you um, three different vocabulary words, and I want uh, to see a uh, show of hands on each one of them. So how many people think change is a, is a threat? You know, they kind of wake up in the morning and they say, I know what my agenda is today. It's written out in my planner. Um, you know, I'm ready to go because I know what's going on. That's the first option. The second op option is, is, you know, change is an opportunity. This is the person who gets up every morning and says, I don't know what's going to happen today, but boy, I'm really looking forward to what's going to happen. And maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be bad, but um, the fact that I'm not quite sure yet is part of the thing that I like. And then the uh, third uh, option is, is challenge. Um, maybe someplace in the middle between those two. So let me see a show of hands on the threat <coughs> side, who, who really kind of doesn't really like change that much. I mean, it's, it's OK to not like change. It's, um, it's perfectly uh, reasonable, actually, to not like change. You're comfortable with your agenda. You're comfortable with where you live. You're comfortable with your friends, uh, the subject matter that you're studying, and, and that sort of thing. So nobody is kind of a threat person. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, well, maybe this should have been an anonymous. Um, okay, who really like 
goes for the completely unplanned approach to life. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's going to be, you know, whatever's going to happen is fine. Okay, so we have maybe uh, a quarter. Okay. And then the, uh, the challenge, that's kind of like, that's the one that everybody's willing to, to, to take. That's the other 75%. Uh, yeah. Yep, all three is also an option. Um, I'm going to use our little internal poll here as, uh, as uh, when I come back later to talk about what the polls say about the overall um, or the average American in the U.S. economy. Um, I'm going to talk now, and you're not going to be able to see, um, but that's okay. I'll come back later and we'll add some uh, charts uh, at the end. Um, so I want to talk today about the challenge, the challenge of trade and technological change. And the bottom line is that to create a bigger economic pie, which is what we want to do as people involved in economics and in, in policy making, creating a bigger economic pie requires both promoting change in other words, we really want to have change happen. But it also demands that we put into place the policy situations and the policy tools to facilitate adjustment to change. So in some sense, it's not just enough to make for a bigger pie. That's not enough. And, and this got a little bit controversial because I think some people would say it's enough to make it a bigger pie. It's enough to make a bigger pie. But I'm going to argue, in fact, that if that a bigger pie is not enough, we also have to ensure that we can adjust as workers and businesses and so forth, communities, to adjust to that bigger pie. If we try to limit or slow down the types of things that really generate change, such as changes in technology, or changes in globalization, if we try to slow those down or redirect them or limit them, that does forego very real and very large gains. I'm going to give you some numbers on that. These gains come in the form of productivity growth. They come in the form of job creation. They come in the form of innovation. There is no doubt that the pie is smaller if we forego technological change, it is also very clear, and most people would agree with that point, the pie is also, without a doubt, smaller if we forego globalization. And that point is more controversial. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. On the other hand, that's the pie part. Uh, what about this facilitating adjustment uh, to in a sense, get to the outer limits of this bigger pie. If we fail to address the adjustment costs, we are also going to be limiting the gains that we potentially could enjoy from these changes, technology and globalization. Why? Because if we do not address the adjustment costs, we end up with a set of workers' skills and a set of business products that are not well matched to the economic needs of people in our country or other places. So failure to address adjustment costs implies mismatches in the economy. And on the one hand, these mismatches generate a lot of individual and personal anxiety, which we have read about a lot in the newspaper. But it is also clear that these kinds of mismatches in terms of who and what skills workers have and what kind of things businesses can do, that these kinds of adjustment costs also limit businesses' willingness to come up with new ideas. Between personal anxiety on the worker side and a, a, uh, limit, uh, limited uh, ability to adjust on the business side, in other words, if we, facilitate, if we fail to facilitate adjustment and thus leading to a situation where businesses are kind of not willing to innovate 
and workers don't have the right skills. Those things together lead to a period of economic stagnation. And so we're operating inside the potential size of the pie that is offered to us by globalization and technological change. It's almost as if we operate inside the production possibility frontier of the economy because we are not able as workers or as businesses and therefore, those are the two major pieces of the economy, we can't get to this outer frontier. We're kind of stuck inside it. So we have this potential that comes from trade and technological change to expand the economic pie, but a chunk of the population and therefore the economy as a whole is not going to be able to enjoy all those gains to get to the outer frontier unless we promote adjustment to the changes. So our policy objective has to be to focus both on promoting change and on facilitating adjustment to change. We can't limit change, we can't forego it, and we also cannot ignore the distribution. Distribution, many people think of distribution, you know, who gets the bigger part of the pie, many people think of that as being a political choice. And I would argue that failure to, this, to, failure to address the issues of adjustment and distribution is a failure to fully use effectively and efficiently all the resources available in an economy. So redistribution is not something that you think about later or, well, let's see if the market can work it out. It's something that needs to be addressed up front. And given the pace of technological change, and I will argue this in more specific detail looking at some data for information technology, that uh, the pace of technological change being what it is, the issue about redistribution and effectively using policy to do that, to promote adjustment to change, both on the part of businesses and on the part of labor, is a key ingredient of ensuring the economic benefits going forward for the U.S. economy. So what I'd like to do here is talk about economic gains broadly defined from global engagement in the U.S. economy. I'm going to talk a little bit about the numbers that we can derive from empirical research about how the economy gains from global engagement, which I'm going to define in a minute. And then I'm going to talk about these, the adjustment costs. What do we know from the data about the challenges of adjustment? So I'm going to kind of do the, the good side, and I'm going to do the not so good side, and then I'm going to narrow down to just look at information technology as a specific sector, because here is a place where <coughs> change is happening so rapidly that we can um, get at some of these issues uh, uh, very quickly in the data. Global engagement and technological change. What do we mean by global engagement? What we mean is uh, increasing the exposure of U.S. business and U.S. labor to international trade on the one hand, that's something people understand right away, but also increasing their exposure to cross holdings of ownership. In other words, the role of foreign direct investment, both U.S. direct investment abroad and direct investment by foreign owners into the U.S. economy. So it's not just exports and imports, but it's also these flows of capital. So I'm going to draw on some work here that done by my colleagues, uh, Dave Richardson um, and Howard Lewis in a, in a small book, Why Global Commitment Really Matters, and from, from very detailed work by my colleague Brad Jensen and two of his co-authors, um, Andy Bernard and Jeff Schott. What do we know about firms when they engage in international trade? That's our first dimension of global engagement. We know, based on very, very detailed plant-level data, that firms that export compared to ones that do not, firms that export have faster sales growth, 0.6 to 1.3 percentage points faster sales growth. They are 8.5% less likely to go bankrupt. What about workers at those firms? Do they get any of the gains or does it all go to the CEO? 
workers at firms that have this characteristic um, are um, two to four uh, percent likely to have an increase in employment. In other words, employment grows at those firms by two to four percent faster growth. Strikingly, these firms and the workers in the firms offer benefits like health and uh, education and so forth. These benefits for the workers at these kinds of firms are 37% higher in terms of uh, numerical dollar value of their benefits. So workers gain, firms gain if they're exporters. Now, in some sense, that's the easiest form of global engagement. Exports are a slam dunk because, you know, you're selling more stuff, so of course you're going to do better. What about importers? Companies that import and actually don't export anything. So we're comparing companies that import with companies that don't import anything, don't export anything either. Importers are more likely to receive foreign direct investment. So a company that is imports products is actually more likely to receive foreign direct investment, capital investment from abroad. Uh, now, this uh, capital investment from abroad is used to purchase a higher percentage of advanced manufacturing technologies. So you've got more advanced manufacturing technologies being used in firms in the United States, even if they are just firms that import. How do workers gain? They gain about $1,000 more per year in salary for every 10% of the company's um, inputs that are imported. So they gain in a very real term by working at companies that through capital flows and capital investment, even if they do not export at all. <coughs> now, how does this work? How do we get these changes? And what happens to the type of workers and skills and technologies that are in, in these firms? What is the process? Through outsourcing, meaning importing intermediate inputs from abroad, if they say, for example, come from China, so it's a very low wage situation, what we know about the dynamics of what happens inside the individual plant, and again, these are the very detailed data that we have on individual plants, so I'm not kind of just making this up, but there's empirical research behind it. What we know about what happens in, from low wage outsourcing, okay, for example, to China, is that Plants that are at the uh, least capital intensive end of the spectrum, they go out of business. And workers at those plants become unemployed or they become employed at plants that are higher up the technology spectrum. Now we already knew that because I said, well, importing plants tend to be uh, more advanced manufacturing technologies. So we have output employment being pushed towards more capital intensive plants. However, firms respond as well by producing a different range of products. They don't try to compete with the Chinese imported products. They change their product mix towards capital and skill intensive production methods. So we have a change in uh, who in, plant, in the plant universe, which ones succeed and fail. But we also have a change in production technology, in the type of worker skills demanded, and in the type of products that are being produced. Now this is going to be important because we're going to see exactly the same kind of things happen very uh, uh, specifically in um, information technology. And it turns out there's a lot of productivity benefits for the economy as a whole generated off of the change in production technology, the change in workplace practices, and the change in products being produced. Now we buy things in intermediate imports, not just from low-wage places in China. We do actually import a lot of other things, not just from China. Um, so what happens if we start importing products from higher uh, income countries, uh, from the OECD countries, from European countries? from, say, a Korea, which is a middle-income country. What that does is it tends to replace the low-skill jobs and the inputs. So this whole process 
changes the skill demands on the, in the labor force. We have increasing technological intensity. We have increasing demand for skills in the workforce. And we have higher skill intensity or technological intensity of the products. Okay. Now, I said that foreign direct investment played a very important role in terms of global engagement. We also can quantify that, again, looking at the plant level data. So let's compare a plant that is part of a multinational family. So you've got the parent here, and you've got affiliates abroad, like the auto companies do come to mind here when we're thinking about this. Um, so we're comparing a plant that's part of a multinational family with a U.S. parent compared with plants that are not globally engaged at all. What we find is that in those companies, or those plants, labor productivity is 11% higher. These plants are 31% more likely to use advanced manufacturing technologies. And the workers at the plants that are globally engaged in this way through FDI they earn a 7 to 15 percent wage premium over similar workers at plants that are not participating in the global economy. So once again, we see a relationship between global engagement, technological intensity, and benefits to workers through wage premium. And we saw already that that wage premium has as its very key ingredient, a higher skill level of the worker. So the change that is being uh, happening here as part of global engagement pushes the economy and everybody in it in a direction of higher technological intensity, higher skill intensity. It's not just the case that US parents, uh, as part of a multinational family, that this is true. It is also true for the U.S. located affiliates of foreign parents. So even if your parent is not a U.S. parent, but a foreign parent, there is faster sale growth, higher advanced manufacturing technology usage in the plant, very large wage premium to workers. Why is this? Again, the manner is multinational companies have greater financial resources. They can afford to buy the technological enhancement for the company. They have a greater global reach to take advantage of global finance, global resources, and global markets. So we have this bigger pie that's being generated in the United States, in part because there's a bigger market out there in the global economy that we are engaged in. So the bottom line for global sourcing in this big sense is to get down to the final numbers on this, um, globally engaged firms, which is trade and capital flows, pay wages of about $50,000 compared to identical workers at similar plants that are not globally engaged that earn $35,000 a year. So there's a $15,000 wage premium earned by workers who are participating in global engagement through their companies. They have to have higher skills in order to do that. It is also the case that when you're globally engaged, as we increase our global engagement, we also get more exposed to changes in demand abroad that we have no control over slack demand abroad, or the Asian financial crisis, or anything like that. So global engagement has as both the positive dimension, you get more money, you have more skills, but you are also exposed to greater volatility. And that is a key ingredient in thinking about some of the issues having to do with the cost. So I'm going to now move to what are some of the costs. I sort of said the benefits were pretty big but that there were some issues about costs of adjustment. I'm going to talk now about some work that my colleague Lori Kletzer, who's at the UC Santa Cruz, has done, uh, again, in several, uh, a number of different uh, outlets for her work. 
And uh, she, can, she looks at um, so-called dislocated workers. That's the description, because the data set is the dislocated workers survey. So we uh, know um, a, a individuals in this survey, and we can track them over time um, from one type of job to another. So we know how much they earned in, their, in the job before they lost their job. We know what they earned afterwards. We know which sector they went into, and so forth. So what do we know by looking at this dislocated worker survey? In the 20 years between 79 and 1999, um, there were uh, 17 million people, 17 million people displaced from the manufacturing sector. Now keep in mind that there's a labor force of about 130 million in the United States. Um, of the 17 million displaced from manufacturing, um, about six and a half came from places, uh, sectors like electronics, apparel, autos, steel, ones with very high exposure, very high global engagement. I just sort of said these were the good firms in terms of a lot of attributes. Um, so who were these people who lost their jobs? What attributes do, did they have that made them more likely to lose their job um, as part of the overall gain that the economy was getting and that some of their colleagues were getting too from working at these um, globally engaged firms and plants. Um, the people who lost their jobs tended to be old, older. Um, they had tended to be at their job for a long period of time. Uh, this is especially true in the case of production workers in the manufacturing sector. But what was particularly, or has been particularly interesting about the work on dislocated uh, workers is that the workers who lost their jobs in sectors that were high global engagement sectors look identical to the workers who lost their jobs in other parts of the economy. So you can't distinguish workers who lose their jobs in manufacturing, whether it's be in a highly globally engaged sector or not. So that suggests that what we're looking at in terms of leading to dislocation and adjustment costs spans globalization and is related much more fundamentally to the issue of change, technological change. Um, if we expand our sample and look more at more recent job loss, so not just manufacturing, but kind of the bigger universe to include service workers, which of course is a, a bigger sector, section of the economy, 35% um, of the people losing their jobs in the last 10 years are white collar workers. And they have some college education. So the issue of change and adjustment and dislocation is moving up the skill ladder as defined by educational attainment and is moving out of manufacturing and more broadly into the economy as a whole. So if misery loves company, there's a lot more potentially there. Uh, consequences of job loss. What happens to people when they lose their jobs? This is a, a, you know, a, a very interesting, again, a very interesting uh, examination of the data. 70% uh, of the people who lose their jobs, and again, we know individuals using this survey, 70% of these people do get a new job. 30% don't get a new job. They go back to school or they retire. And obviously, it would be nice to know a little bit more about exactly the share there. Um, and that's one of the things that Lori's looking at. Within manufacturing, 50% got a new job. So basically, manufacturing, it's harder to get another manufacturing job as it is in services to get another service job. I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody who has kind of been out and about in the Detroit area. Um, how much do people earn at their new job? Because, you know, on the one hand, losing a job is stressful and it's really uh, unpleasant. But if you earned more, 
at the new job, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Um, on average, uh, average wages at the new jobs are 13% lower. So job uh, loss leads to, on average, a lower salary. But in fact, there isn't anybody at that average. It's a bimodal distribution. 36% of the people who lose their job got a higher or a salary. 25% had a huge earnings loss. So within that, av that average is an average over people who did just as well at, or better at their new job, where the change ended up being very good for them. And another large set experienced very, very dramatic changes in their economic fortunes. And so the widening disparity between those who are able to adjust to the changes and those who are not. Okay. I'd like to now go to um, what Americans really think about change. If that's the backdrop of the economic environment that people have been experiencing over the last 20 years, and particularly over the last 15, what do public opinions polls say about Americans' attitude towards change? Are we inherently pro-change? Sort of the westward ho type of people? Are we still, you know, westward ho type of people from, you know, the early 1800s and so forth? Or are we kind of like, uh, no, don't really like to change. I kind of am happy with where I am. Um, and so I'm going to draw on our little poll here that we had at the beginning where we said, um, you know, about 25% of people were, uh, got, were westward hoe types. <laughs> I'm going to pick up. I'm going to go. And, but about 75% were, you know, it's kind of pros and cons. I'm not sure I want to go. Uh, you know, I don't know where I'm going. And the wagon's kind of, uh, you know, it's not really uh, going to be tough to get over those mountains to California and stuff like that. Um, if we ask these questions to people in public opinion polls, so it's, for example, the Pew uh, poll or the uh, PIPA poll that's out of Maryland. And, uh, and here I'm drawing on some research by my colleagues Ken Sheeve, who's actually next door to you at uh, the Public Policy School at the um, University of Michigan, and a colleague of mine, Matt Slaughter, who's at Dartmouth. Um, they've pulled together a number of these questions over time um, about Americans' attitudes towards change. Um, 56% of Americans say that making a transition to a new job with higher wages is not worth it. So, fifth, so in that sense, you guys are quite, you know, you're, you know, you're really positive about change in comparison to the average American. Um, on the other hand, when we start to narrow the question down a little bit more and talk about what kinds of things are generating change and are forcing adjustment? What we're finding in uh, that, uh, if you ask the question, you know, what about if the change comes uh, due to technological change? 57% um, say it's important for the United States to remain on the cutting edge and promote innovation and technological change even if jobs are lost in the process. So even though people are kind of only so-so about change, they really want to stay, I mean, they also want to stay on the edge. They want to stay on the technological edge. If you ask them a question, instead of saying, well, um, instead of technological change and staying on the uh, innovative edge, is it worth it? If you ask them, um, we want to get the gains from globalization, those gains that I was describing to you in terms of higher productivity growth and more sales growth and higher wage premium and advanced manufacturing <laughs> technology, all those good things. Um, do you want to do that? Um, you know, only about 50% say they want to do that if jobs are lost. So technology and trade and change are 
not slam dunks in terms of, of Americans' attitudes towards change. We are very ambivalent as a nation in these polls. We are very ambivalent about change, even if it makes us better off. We're not really sure we want to go there. Why are we so ambivalent about change? Well, I think we can see that um, in a couple of different uh, ways. One is, if we ask people in these public opinion polls, um, are, do you think it's a good idea to pursue this globalization gains and this high, bigger pie thing? And that's all you ask them, they say, that's 50-50, yeah, yes, no. But if you then say, we want to pursue greater globalization because you get to have more products, things are cheaper, we have these wage gains, premiums from global engagement, all this good stuff, and we're willing to uh, use some of those gains to promote adjustment, to have worker adjustment programs, to finance more education and training. What is your opinion then? Overwhelmingly, people are willing to, to move forward on greater global engagement. 80% of people say, yes, if that's the deal, that there is change, but I get some assistance with dealing with the adjustment costs, then I'll go for it. So we're ambivalent about change if we think we have to do it by ourselves with no support from, uh, from somebody else. Whether it's the government or not, that's not so much of the question. So we're concerned about our ability to, to change and we're ambivalent to change if we're asked to do this alone because we know by looking at the dislocated workers that um, if you're a high school graduate and that's all your education is, you're not likely to be reemployed if you lose your job. Uh, and you're certainly not going to get paid more the new job. Um, if you have a college degree, you are much more likely to be able to find a new job and at a higher wage. So a lot of our concern and our ambivalence about change is because we don't think we're prepared. We don't think we're prepared for those jobs that demand higher skills and demand uh, ability to use new technologies. If we look at the, you know, that's the individual. But if we look at the economy as a whole, you know, some people say, but, but look, you know, look at all these people who are going to college. Surely we must be getting more skilled as a country. Surely it must be the case that, you know, we are increasing our skill level in a macro sense in the population. So it's just a matter of kind of, of uh, you know, getting past this phase and just getting more people through the college education system. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, half of the U.S. workforce only has a high school education. And even more disturbing, that's the half that's currently working, and even more disturbing, I think, is that we're graduating in our nation we are graduating the, uh, co a, a lower percentage of the high school level uh, age group cohort now than we were in the 1960s and 70s. So if we're thinking about um, educational attainment in the United States, the bottom, which is, would be described as high school dropout, the bottom in terms of educational attainment is not moving upward in terms of educational attainment, it's moving downward. So this is a population that is even less able to participate in global engagement than before. At the top end, we are increasing the level of educational attainment at the top end. So people in college are going back for more degrees, masters in this, certificate in that, and, and so forth. So the, the people who are at the higher education end are even more able to engage in the global economy, to get these wage premium and so forth. So as a nation, what we're doing is we're, we're pulling apart in um, terms of level of educational attainment and therefore pulling apart in terms of our ability to 
engage with the global economy and get the gains, and we're pulling apart in terms of our opinions about technological change, global engagement, and so forth. Um, layer on top of this, the pace of technological change that we're currently in the midst of. So let's talk about IT for just a second, and then we'll talk about it some more. Um, skill depreciation in rapidly changing professions, like information technology, like healthcare, like engineering, the skill depreciation is very rapid. And so if the skill depreciation is occurring exactly for those people who are getting more skilled. So here are people who went to college, they have certificates and so forth. They are people who have to continuously work to increase their skills. And for a lot of people, that wasn't the bargain that they made when they went to college. Their bargain was, if I go to college, then I'm set. And that was true in 1970, maybe 1980. It isn't true anymore. And so there's, in some sense, there's an erosion of the level of skill attainment as defined by techno technology. So our bottom line is, as individuals and our attitude towards change is a lot of people are very scared that they aren't, uh, aren't prepared and that therefore they can't compete. And it's not really their fault. It's not really their fault. Um, I've, in the course of my, my uh, talking about this, I, I have a lot of people who say something on the order of, I've played by the rules, now I've lost my job, and nobody can tell me what I should do next. I played by the rules, I went to college, I got that degree, and now you're telling me it's not good enough anymore. And the fact is it's true. It's true. And being the bearer of that kind of news doesn't necessarily make you somebody's friend, for sure. Um, Okay, uh, let's talk now about what enables change and promotes adjustment to change. First, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about how much change is going on in the US economy all the time. Um, and then talk a little bit about what's going on in the global economy. Creative destruction, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about if you've been in economics class, um, we can define creative disruption in the job market as uh, how many jobs are created and how many jobs are destroyed over a period of time in the U.S. economy. Um, job creation and job loss uh, is, is really quite dramatic in the U.S. economy. Um, when we hear the numbers that come out every month, they're in terms of net jobs, like 120,000 jobs were created in this month. But what's much more interesting is gross uh, job creation and job loss. And, and probably many people don't realize that about a quarter of the labor force, so we have 130 million people, so a quarter of them turn over and change their job each year. So underneath this, this number of people who lose their jobs, there's a lot of people who are losing and gaining jobs all the time. So a tremendous amount of job churn in the US economy. One of the most notable features of the period of time since the peak of the technology boom and the present is there's been a real drop in job churn. Drop in losses, drop in gains. So there has been a pulling back from creative destruction in the US economy over the last four and a half years. Rather than in the, in the boom time, in all the whole 1990s, throughout that entire period, there were more losses and more gains. So the job churn increased over that entire 10-year period. The last four and a half years, it's fallen. Even though the unemployment rate has kind of come down over the past couple of uh, months, job churn, creative destruction in the US economy has 
started to contract. What uh, researchers suggest about that, this is Simon Potter and Erica Groshen, in particular from the New York Fed, um, and also Martin Arrive, is that this contraction of job churn represents exactly that being inside the potential gains of globalization. There are mismatches between worker skills and what's demanded. There are mismatches between what businesses uh, think they should be producing and what they can sell. So this structural change and this drop in creative destruction in the US economy, you can think of as being a, an inability to adjust outward to the possibilities being offered to us. We have another problem, though, that's not of our own making, although I'm not even sure the first one is either. And the problem is that um, the global economy has not been a growth engine for the US economy. The global economy has been very stagnant with respect to purchases of US products. A number of reasons for that. We can talk about that a lot. But um, creative destruction in the US economy has uh, and the slowdown in that and, the com and has combined with a really tepid demand situation in the rest of the world to both cause a lot of change but not help promote it. And so we've kind of had a situation where we have a lot of change being undertaken but we don't have a, an expanding market to take advantage of it. So the, if we think of that as the big picture, what I'd like to do now for a couple of minutes is focus in on just information technology. Because this is a, pay, a place where the pace of change in terms of technological change, in terms of where production and demand are taking place around the world, has moved very, very quickly. To information technology is also a sector or place where there are very, very strong synergies between technological change and globalization. So heretofore, I've sort of said, well, there's globalization on the one side and then sort of technological change on the other side. IT, they're the same. And you really can't, it's really difficult to distinguish between the two of them. Now, most people, uh, already are familiar with the story about information technology and its role in the positive period of time in the US economy in the 1990s and even up to today. To today. What I'd like to um, just remind you of and, and add a little more to is what was the role of globalization? Did, you know, if IT, if information technology products had been entirely homegrown, we didn't import them from any place else. <coughs> Entirely homegrown. Would there have been any difference in the behavior of the US economy? And I would argue there would be a significant difference in the behavior of the US economy. And that's because globalization did have, continues to have, an impact on the prices of these things that we buy, these IT prices, IT computer and the box and the DRAMs and the servers and the routers and the other pieces of IT equipment. Um, based on my, my work with some of the data on um, globalization of IT, prices are about 10 to 30 percent lower than they otherwise would have been. So that, we all know it's a lot cheaper now than it used to be, but it's about 10 to 30 percent cheaper on account of globalization of production of this machine here. 10 to 30 percent cheaper. It's already had a big price decline of, say, 90 percent, most of which being generated out of technological innovation by US researchers. So how much difference does 10 to 30 percent make? Turns out it makes uh, a difference of about a 0 0.3 percentage point increase in GDP growth which adds up to the neighborhood of 250 to 500 billion dollars. So it adds up to being a lot of money. This is another way of measuring how bigger the pie is. 500 billion dollars. 10 trillion dollar economy, 500 billion dollars, not a big percentage, but in terms of 
dollars, it's a fairly sizable one. Now, um, now I'd like to show you a picture. Okay. Behind that overall macroeconomic gain that the U.S. economy enjoyed, there is very different diffusion and productivity performance throughout the economy. And this chart gets us at thinking about what is the potential for the next wave of productivity growth, the potential for how globalization may expand our pie even bigger. And I'll talk about adjustment before we end. Um, in here, uh, the, what we've got here on the, on the horizontal axis is how much information technology capital is used in various sectors of the economy. The sectors are the bubbles. The bigger the bubble, the bigger the sector in the US economy. So from left to right, we have increasing intensity in the use of information technology. Vertical axis is a measure of contributions of productivity growth. So the higher up on the axis, the greater the productivity growth of the sector. So if you were to draw a line through that, you would have the positive correlation between information technology capital and productivity growth that I just described in the macroeconomic context was um, gains in GDP growth. But you'll also see here that um, all the green bubbles are the ones who, that are above average in terms of IT intensity and productivity growth. And the blue are below average in terms of IT and productivity. So there's quite a, quite a dispersion. And what do we know about these various sectors? What, what kind of things can we draw on to help us understand why some were leading sectors and really drove the productivity performance of the United States? And what about the lagging sectors? What do we know about them? The first observation is the leading sectors are not information technology sectors, except for one of them. And that's electronic and other equipment, which is one of those green bubbles that's sort of right next to wholesale. So that is the IT sector. It's highly productive, uses a lot of IT to make IT, but it's not a very big sector of the US economy. So far more important for the productivity performance of the United States is that there are all these other sectors, these green bubbles, like wholesale, think FedEx, securities and commodities brokers, think uh, Schwab, depository institutions, think Citigroup. These are all sectors that use information technology. They don't produce it. They use it to do what they want to do to promote their own business better, cheaper. The other observation about most of these sectors is that they are mostly service-related sectors, not so much manufacturing. Well, there's some manufacturing in there. In addition to having higher rates of IT investment and higher productivity growth, these sectors are also the ones who hire the most IT professionals. They are, not, they are people who are employed in the occupation with IT in the name, but they are not employed by Microsoft. They are not employed by Oracle. They are employed by the hospital. They are employed, well, not so many of them, but they are employed by the, the uh, finance groups. They are employed by FedEx or Schneider Trucking. And those, are, those people, more people, two-thirds of the people who are in the IT occupations do not work for any IT company that you've ever heard of, because they don't work for IT companies. Um, they also run balance of payment surplus. Um, so finance, for example, runs balance of payment surplus, insurance surplus, and business professional services surplus. What about the lagging sectors, the ones that are on the other side? Um, why do some sectors lag? Why are some of them down at the, at the bottom? They may always be at the bottom. <coughs> They may always be lagging. Health services, for example, education, construction, they may always be lagging sectors. But what would be the possibility of moving this entire graph this way, or actually this way, increased productivity? How could we make that happen? Um, well, what we know about IT hardware versus IT services is that 
IT hardware has been globalized, so it has lower prices. IT services and software just barely has started to become globally engaged. And as a consequence, you can see uh, that IT hardware in 1993, for every dollar of IT hardware, people spent $1.50 trying to make it work, software and services. In the year 2003, for every dollar of IT hardware, people had to spend $3 on the people and the software to try to make it work. So it's not about the box anymore. That's a commodity. You can get it anywhere, but how do you make it work for the application that you need it for. And the applications for health services and construction are much more challenging than applications for finance or for wholesale trade. Why is that? Because a couple reasons. The first one is finance was networked, the main bank 12 subsidiaries, was networked long ago. Your ATM card and all the machines associated with it is an information technology network. So financial firms already knew how to deal with IT. And so they just expanded their use of it. Health services. There is no information technology or really any other network other than maybe the phone between the various players in the health services uh, the pantheon of, of health services providers, the pharmacy, hospital, uh, physical therapist, the doctor's office, and there is no common platform or other networked relationship that these uh, units can build on. And so it's natural for them to lag. Doesn't mean that they can't improve. Just it's natural for them to lag. It's also natural that for them to lag, given the regulatory complexity, which is associated with coming up with applications that will work for the least lagging sectors. These are the next frontier of applications for information technology. It's the next frontier. Um, um, let's go to here. So, but what do we, if those are all the benefits and where we'd like to go, that information technology services and software becoming globalized like IT hardware will generate the kinds of improved economic gains that we saw played out so far. What does this mean in terms of the adjustment side of things, the adjustment costs? This diagram tells you something about how um, IT workers are related to IT investment. The green and the blue dotted lines are employment growth and investment growth. You can see the boom from 1991 to the year 2000, and you can see the technology crash and the slow recovery. So this is the complementarity between IT investment and IT workers that I argued was observable in the case of the sectoral level data, the bubble chart before. So there's a, a, cycl a cyclical adjustment or an adjustment to a technology cycle that is part of the adjustment cost facing IT workers just as it has faced other workers before. But there is another thing happening. We can see it specifically in IT but it's exactly what I said was happening more generally in the economy as a whole. There are significant changes in the structure of skills being demanded that we can see in data from a short, enough, a short time period as 1999 to the end of 2003. These are the very, very detailed data on occupational classes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I give you three different boxes there, a red box, a black box, and a green box. The data as a whole look at different kinds of workers in uh, using information technology. 
There are low wage workers in the red box, people who work at call centers, people who work uh, with a word processor, people who punch in data, so data entry people. Uh, on average, they earn $25,000 a year. Uh, looking at the last line, the total call center and low wage, what you see there is in the period of time between 1999 and November 2003, which is the, data, the period over which we have this information, 30% of the people who were employed in those jobs in 1999 were not employed in those jobs <coughs> in November 2003. This was not a technology cycle. This was not a crash of the technology cycle. This was people being replaced by technology, either <coughs> directly replaced by technology, such as voice-activated uh, stuff, um, like when you call the airport and you have to punch in all the numbers that tell you, you know, will your flight be on time? That's voice-activated technological change, replacing the people. Or some of these people were also replaced by technology and technology-enabled international trade and services, meaning people from India, Ireland, Philippines, and so forth. So 30% of the people in that, those job categories no longer are in that job category. They, are, they, in some sense, represent the low end of the skill distribution that I said was getting even more uh, disaffected by change. And that will continue to be true. Um, and as a reference point, production workers in the manufacturing sector, which a lot of people have focused on, on, on the, the collapse of employment in the manufacturing sector over the same time period, it's a little hard for you to read there, but um, over that same time period, the reduction of number of production workers in the manufacturing sector was 20%. Now, let's look at um, the black box. So we're now looking at um, IT workers that work at lots of other places, not, more, not necessarily Microsoft and so <coughs> forth. So we're looking at the, the whole set of people employed um, and we're looking at computer programmers, because we hear a lot about them. And um, they earn a lot of money, on average $65,000, that's a far column. 30% of those people who are employed as programmers in 1999 are no longer employed in that category, in that job category, 30%. Um, so those people, too, higher up the skill spectrum, People who surely had a college degree, or most of them did, some of them had masters in computer science, are no longer employed in that job category because that job category <coughs> represents what is now routine. Programming in the 1970s, each program was a work of art. It was unique for specific application. That's not true anymore. And my example is my husband's a big technology guy, and he was a crack, crack programmer back uh, then. Doesn't do that anymore. Um, I, and my son is 12, and my son can do in 10 minutes with um, HTML basic, web basic thing that would have been do something for a, a web page. He can write a program in 10 minutes to do what would have taken my husband three man months to do in the early 1980s. So dramatic, dramatic change in the pace of technological change that is hitting at a class of workers for whom what they do used to be a work of art and now is a commodity. On the other hand, let's look at the green box. We've got application engineers, system software, analysts, database people, uh, more analysts. These are people who have to put together the pieces, the commodity pieces of programs to meet the specific needs of the companies, such as in healthcare, or in finance, or in wholesale trade. They're the people who work at Schneider Trucking. They're the people who work at FedEx. They're the people who work at Charles Schwab. They aren't programmers anymore. The programmers are in India. They are putting together the pieces of programming tools. They are figuring out and designing the applications that meet the needs of 
these companies, and they're sitting and holding hands to make this box work. So it actually will work the way it's supposed to for people who are not, uh, you know, the computer geek types. That is a very different set of skills. It's design. It's analysis. It's integration. It's communication. That is a very different set of skills than the people who went to school and got a computer science or an engineering degree even 10 years ago. So this pace of change, the moving up of the skill change to a higher level is really dramatic. So let me, um, I'm running way over here. Um, <coughs> what options do we have to promote adjustment to change? What are our options? Because I'm arguing that if we do not promote adjustment to change, then we operate inside the potential of the economy. For those at the low end, the $25,000 a year, unemployment insurance, the earned income tax credit, training credits, um, health care pension portability, if they either have any of those, standard set of a more expanded unemployment insurance. What about these other people who had already displayed the capability to learn, to go through advanced education, but for whom technology change is now eroding and depreciating their skills? The human capital tax credit, the human capital investment tax credit, is a strategy to deal with incumbent workers, people who haven't lost their job yet, but who will lose their job if they don't tech up more or change and you know, develop communication skills, go back and get an MBA or get a technology degree in healthcare, something like that. Um, <coughs> this investment tax credit instrument fits a classic set of market failures in the economy of uh, the labor market. The classic set of market failures are free riders, where firms don't train their workers enough because they don't get to reap the fruits of their training uh, because you can go to another job. Um, they, uh, it fits the classic case of the spillover. The economy as a whole is better off if everybody has a higher skill level because of this movement that I've already described in a couple different dimensions towards a need for higher skills, so spillovers. And also incomplete information. An individual is not going to know what training they need. The business does because the business is currently scouring the entire globe for the skills that they want. They should be looking more closely at the skills that they have and building on those. But they face these disincentives of free riders. The investment tax credit is a way of dealing with the disincentive to train in your own incumbent workforce for the types of skills that are needed as the business plan uh, becomes uh, more global. So um, where are we at the end of this? Um, we have a situation where um, trade and technology are both very demanding. Skill depreciation and inter international competition are real. They are not going to go away. We don't want them to go away. But worker development is a critical component of being able to reap the gains of the technological change in globalization. And if we fail to do that, we are not, we are not maximizing the possibilities available to the US economy. So workers and educators really need to be working together to come up with superior strategies for working with incumbent workers to move them up the skill level. Businesses also have an important role to play here. Evaluating outsourcing critical, critically is very important. There is a tendency to be a pendulum. Everybody goes this way in outsourcing, <coughs> realizing that you know it's not the right strategy for all companies. Then the pendulum comes back this way, and workers uh, are hurt at both ends. Businesses lose a lot of potential profits 
by changing an investment strategy. So thinking more critically about the outsourcing decision and incorporating all of the costs, as well as the benefits, are a key ingredient for businesses. The other um, caution that I would give to business is that cost reductions that come from the right kind of outsourcing yields profits and opportunities for technological innovation and new product development. No business grows well through cost cutting alone. No business grows well through cost cutting alone. And so the real question for business as they're thinking about how to move forward in this uh, global environment is what kind of innovations and products are the businesses creating to drive the next wave of productivity and growth? And for workers and educators, it's what are you doing? And for policymakers like me, what am I doing as in the government's role uh, to ensure that adjustment to the greater possibilities that come from globalization and technological change are actually enjoyed by the maximum percentage of the population. Thank you. Dr. Mann has agreed to take a few of our questions, so if you've got questions, raise your hand. Um, I'm not sure that I've seen in the, um, in the uh, polls that type of um, uh, classification. So I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very good one. Um, we know that there are some differences based on age, although not as much difference as you would think. Um, port the, po the polls on, for example, um, are, are, uh, if you're, if you're a, a worker in the auto industry, for example, are you more likely to dislike globalization than, say, somebody who works in healthcare? And the answer is no. What's interesting is, is the attitudes towards change and the attitudes towards uh, globalization in particular, that 50-50, was not stratified by industry. It was not stratified by industry. It was stratified by education. And um, I think that's very important because it sort of says, once again, that it's not about globalization per se, even if that's kind of what the name tag you put on it, that it's much more about whether or not people feel like they, can, they have a crack at the, you know, crack at the big time. They have a crack at it. They say, OK, well, I'm, I'm willing to make the adjustment. But if I, if I really don't think I can compete in the big leagues, then I'd rather not have a big league available in some sense. Relevant for you in basketball, I understand. <laughs> Yes. Um, when you talk about uh, you need to evaluate outsourcing critically, yeah. Um, given that the you know the cost of operations between the U.S. and you know let's say India is so low, uh, can you elaborate on the reasons why you would have to really think about it carefully and examine that? Uh, labor costs are only one dimension of the cost. Mm -hmm. um, increasingly. Uh, it is, and, and there are a variety of consultancy reports that address this, but um, it's, it's not just how much do you pay your workers, but you know, what is the cost of your telecom line? What happens when um, power goes out? So variability of infrastructure and cost of infrastructure are key ingredients. And um, when we're, you know, there are different kinds of, of outsourcing, um, some that are more internal to a business operation, back office operation, and some that have more of a customer face. And the, um, the um, backlash uh, with regard to outsourcing of things that are close to the customer is really has really built, and it's really quite dramatic. 
Um, and so when thinking about the costs of outsourcing, uh, one of those costs ought to be, are you going to offend your customers to the point where they will stop using your product? And in terms of back office operation, are you going to offend the other workers that you have that are part of the multinational group such that the overall group has a significant reduction in productivity? Those are things, and you know, frankly, those are very hard things to measure. <coughs> um, and it's, and, it, and give, let me just give you another example that has nothing to do with outsourcing, but it has to do with labor turnover at sort of low-end retail establishments, so well, or, or low-wage people at retail establishments. So we're talking about people who earn twenty-five thousand dollars a year at a retail establishment. So they're the you know they're they're the people who are the customer, the people who greet the customers and so forth. Labor turnover is very very high. Yet and, and so often you know some people who do studies on this say well. Maybe if you paid your workers a little bit more, you know, you wouldn't have to keep on uh, hiring new ones and training new ones. And um, what's surprising is, is that internal to the operations of, of the firm, nobody sort of says, what is the all-in cost of a worker? As in, I have to train that worker, but if, you know, and then I have to pay them, you know, minimum wage. But part of the all-in cost ought to be is, how much do I have to pay when they leave? I have to pay to get another one, which, you know, so there's, a, there's an intergenerational <coughs> effect. And um, one of my friends, again, with the, a trucking company, is facing this issue of a tremendous turnover in long-term, um, in long-distance drivers. And I said, well, you know, has anybody thought about paying them more? And he said, well, I can't get management to do the numbers that include uh, the cost of retraining or cost of getting a new person in. That's sort of like somebody comes in and they're trained and then they stay and then they leave. And then a new one comes and they stay and then they leave. And there's no sense in which there's this, it's an intergenerational, and that one ought to be looking at the costs sort of in a, in a sense of, um, of the workforce as opposed to individual workers, which is the, most of what these companies look at, individual workers, not workforce. So that's similar to the kinds of things on outsourcing and outsourcing, uh, addressing outsourcing critically is to think much more, um, putting a bigger umbrella over what it is that you're trying to price out when you do the numbers. The tendency is to vary very narrow. And I'm suggesting that because of the pieces come together in the value chain, in a, in a, they don't come, they can be fragmented, but they also have synergies. Each piece of the value chain does. It's like the just-in-time delivery. If it doesn't get there, you're doomed. Yes? Why do you suppose the academicians allow the, the administration, the Congress, and the media to perpetuate so much myth about outsourcing? Well, because 50% of the people kind of think the change is not so good. people voted for George Bush, about 50%. <laughs> but, um, sorry. Uh, you have to, work, have to be a little bit careful in Washington, but, or any place else, actually, adding political overtones. But um, there are two things that go on here. One of them, one of them um, has to do with that in the media, for example, there is very definitely a belief that you have to have both sides. So on an issue, for example, like um, globalization, you might actually have 80% of the profession thinking one way, maybe even 90% of the profession thinking one way. But in a media presentation, both sides, you know, both perspectives get equal weight. And let me give you a specific example. <coughs> I was uh, invited to do a debate um, with a couple of well-known uh, anti-globalists and uh, somebody who used to work at the Council of Economic Advisors under, I think it was Reagan. 
And so there was going to be, I thought it was going to be the four of us. And I said, okay, well, I will be the intelligent middle. Costs, benefits, how to make adjustments, the intelligent middle, sit in the middle. And uh, then the, the, the fellow called me back and said, well, this is the way we're going to structure the debate. You and this other person have to divide your time on that, you know, you have to kind of be a team. And the two anti-globalists are also going to be a team. And so he set it up to be two sides. And I said, well, I'm not going to participate. I'm not on that side. You're putting me on this guy's side. I'm not on that side. I'm also not exactly on that side. I'm not on that. I'm not a side. I'm a way of thinking about these issues. That's not usually something that, you know, you don't get to communicate that kind of stuff in the media in general. And, you know, Congress has a whole different agenda. Um, and so outsourcing isn't a big one of it right now. Yeah? With uh, your thoughts on skill depreciation, are universities and colleges with their tenure uh, situation really prepared to deal with uh, helping individuals through that process? Well, um, education is a big business. Investment tax credit, if it actually gets set up, and there's some interest in doing this in, in it did appear in some earlier legislation uh, <coughs> last session. Um, so there's money. It goes to the company, but the company's not actually going to do the training you guys do. Um, are universities prepared to expand their um, educational mandate to a much larger and basically older population? Um, does it fit with their current uh, strategy? Um, based on the, educating, the educators I know, and, and uh, uh, served on this uh, group, the Council on Competitiveness, that had business and think tank people and, um, and educators, the educators kind of, they know that there is a big market out there they know that the kind of stovepipe education that, that has kind of been particularly true of the technical schools, they know that the stovepipe approach isn't training their people right. But it's very, very hard to change the curriculum and structure of educational institutions. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a, a growing awareness which is good. Uh, you know, you got to have the awareness before you're actually going to get anywhere else. But um, I don't see a lot of mobility. But that's, you know, sense of urgency is a, a good thing, so maybe there will be change as a result of it. Yes? My question kind of relates to that. Um, you had mentioned policy uh, tools to be able to make these adjustments wanting to offend your adjustments that you state via the, the tax credits and retraining and education to me seems extremely topical uh, and seems to produce a downside of education becoming just a, a tool or being subservient to firms and employers uh, if its primary function is to, or one of its primary Um, what you're, you're asking a question that actually has come up um, a lot in the, in the, in the context of, um, of uh, training in particular. Um, and uh, at, at one period of time, um, there was a significant uh, discussion of whether or not if you, 
if you trained people for specific jobs in specific companies, so you're, it was very much a firm specific human capital that was being trained uh, for, that you were reducing the ability of the worker to move to some other job at some other company. And so you were locking them in to a particular track and to a particular job and therefore uh, giving essentially all the benefits of the education not to the worker but to the company. I would argue that in a service oriented economy that firm specific human capital of this type is far less important. And these tree training credits are training for general human capital which is applicable across many different sectors. And as a result, by giving people more uh, human capital, you increase their mobility and increase their ability to get the premium that comes from having a higher level of general human capital. So although I, I, you know, I understand your point, um, I think that what we're talking about here is enhancing a skill set that has great applicability across many different job categories. Uh, and I'm certainly not sort of, a, sort of saying you shouldn't study French literature or something like that either. I'm certainly not sort of saying um, all education be, should be you know, focused on uh, a technical track. That doesn't make for a well-trained or well-educated workforce either. I mean, well-educated workforce is a well-rounded workforce. Um, but in terms of skill depreciation, we're talking about people who, in a sense, got their liberal arts education or got their, <coughs> made their choices and now are in the need for refresher, so to speak, um, in a certain uh, class of general humans, human capital skills. Did I hear you just make a strong plea for a, a good, broad liberal arts education? Yeah, I did. You. I did. I did, absolutely. Um, that, as a key foundation. Um, that is a key foundation for a democracy. I mean, I, I think economies can do perfectly well with technical people, but a democracy needs a broader base of education. Yes? You said that. That's my opinion, by the way. Obviously, it could be controversial. <laughs> you said that free trade and globalization is necessarily going to increase the pie. Yeah. But I'm interested in your view on organizations like the WTO and regional trading blocks like NASA and the Free Trade Area of America. Are those necessarily beneficial, or could the over politicization of trade cause some harm? Uh, two different questions there. One, um, you ended up with talking about over politicization of trade and that potentially having a downside to it. <coughs> Um, and then the kind of I, I thought where you were going was sort of our preferential trading arrangements somehow not as good as free trade or something like that. The over politicization of trade, um, it's an interesting question. Uh, sort of if we didn't talk about it so much, maybe we wouldn't think it was so bad. I mean, in some sense, that's, that's what you're saying is that because we have um, uh, because we have uh, global um, institutions that, like the WTO, uh, that we get, we get all uh, the economics of, of global engagement tied up with the, uh, are we going to be losing sovereignty in a political sense and have to have all of our laws about labor and, and the environment and uh, are we allowed to, you know, have certain sort of environmental regulations, are, are those going to become subservient to some, you know, global world order? So there, I mean, the, uh, uh, that's, there, there certainly are, uh, there certainly is an element of um, uh, where people downplay any of the economics about global organization and talk a lot about the subservience that we might end up with by participating in global, uh, global uh, institutions uh, like the World Trade Organization. Um, I don't think the people who are worried about subservience of laws 
I don't think most of them actually uh, are, um, I don't think most of them are thinking about the economics. I think they're, I think they're thinking about the, um, the politics. Um, and so there's, there still remains some bifurcation between politics and economics in that, in that sphere. But it's a, it's a good question. I don't think that we could get away with not talking about uh, the WTO, or if the WTO went away somehow, that I still think we would have all the problems from the economic side that we currently have. As a practical matter, your policy uh, suggestions for investment tax credits uh, benefit information flows to firms. However, um, as you also stated, 50% of the U.S. workforce have more than high school education. How do you increase uh, information flows and reduce the time lag between the time that you know there's going to be a change in the economy uh, to those workers so they can adjust a little bit faster rather than waiting, for example, six or one year down the line and having their employer tell them, due to the structural change, we no longer need you? Um, hmm. uh, <coughs> in terms of something like technological change, I think firms have a pretty good picture of what's coming down the line in a year from now. You know, especially firms that are kind of not cutting edge. They're in the process of, of letting contracts. They're in the process of new product development. They know what kind of workers they're going to need. And the point about the investment tax credit is to integrate the incumbent workforce into the firm's strategic plan. Um, that works for incumbent workers. It does not necessarily help people who are uh, not particularly attached to the labor force, so to the $25,000 a year uh, group. The, the set of policies that we might want to consider for that class of workers, um, and it's not a small class by any means, is I think a different set of, of, of policies. I think it, I think those are policies that have to focus more on um, minimum wage law, on earned income tax credit, and things that raise the standard of living, and at the same time uh, convey the uh, that the gains to educational attainment are really large. So we want to have people who maybe did drop out have the capacity to go back. That's where larger, uh, cheaper student loans, larger grants and aids, in aid for student loans, things like that, um, are part of that um, part of that puzzle for the lower wage workers. So I, I really see a two, you know, the, the bifurcated workforce, different sets of policies to deal with the adjustment problems of the two. Anybody else? Well, perfect timing. Thank you very much.